If you think back uh, in terms of voting, what happens to the range of allocation profiles there? Well, it's a single line because everybody is consuming the same thing, the, the public, uh, the, the candidate which is elected, the outcome. So therefore, the feasible allocation profile move in the diagonal, right? And that's a convex set, but very thin one. In the non-disposable division model, the feasible allocation cover the simplex, right? So it's of dimension n minus one, it's much bigger already, but... Uh, so now it's natural to ask also about full dimension, and, uh, and that's, you could have a, a, a story like this one. I mean, we, we are basically, uh, here it's a kind of a bargaining situation where we are choosing locations on a line, uh, and uh, agent I would like to go to a line to a location PI, which could be positive or negative. Uh, and then uh, there is a budget allowed, a, a total budget to cover those moving costs. And um, there is two parts to the cost. I mean, your own standalone cost to move from zero to XI is XI square. But then there is an externality effect, uh, which is that when you put, you have to put two people close by, it's either it either creates uh, economies of, of cost or additional cost. I mean, for values, you know, you can easily find uh, different interpretations. So you get, a, you get a, a set of feasible allocation, which has this uh, sort of, this is an ellipse, uh, you know, general ellipsoid. And, and you, can, uh, you have all the features of my general uh, theorem. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, that's the result. The model is very simple. In fact, when I started the, the paper and I, I sort of guessed what would be the result, I thought it was going to be a three lines proof. Uh, it's actually more complicated, but the, the model remains quite simple. Uh, apart from a set of agents, basically all we have is a closed and convex set, capital Z in Rn. And that represents, no matter where the, in, those things come from, that represents the set of feasible allocation profiles. So what's important here in terms of the um, application is to think that Xi could, does not have to come from the same type of good, be it public or private or anything. It could be that each Xi is a different private good and we are just distributing, uh, you know, deciding on the allocation based on some very abstract general feasibility constraints. So I am completely abstracting from where it comes from, just looking at the final allocations. So what matters for agent I is the projection of, he, of the full set on his own coordinate because that's where he can hope, that's the range of what he can hope to get as final allocations. So his preferences will be single picked over that range. And a mechanism is going to be a straightforward direct revelation mechanism and I don't need to repeat in this audience why uh, we expect uh, indeed something which will be peak only, something where the mechanism in fact will only ask you to reveal your peak and in fact as, as in that literature we have often observed it's going to be the case that uh, you will be able to deal with su such kind of mechanism. The properties of uh, efficiency and incentive compatibility are standard. Uh, strong group strategy proofness here, which is the strongest, is the one which also includes a non-bossiness in it. Namely, uh, when a coalition of agents considers a deviation, it will never be possible that all agents in the coalition after the deviations are weakly better off and at least one is strictly better off. So that sort of thing, even that sort of thing is ruled out. Uh, continuity. Continuity is actually the, the part of the, the statement which was the most difficult to, uh, to discuss here, uh, to, to prove, sorry. Uh, in, the, in the case of a uh, peak-only mechanism, it simply means that since the peak-only mechanism asks you to reveal a profile of peaks and then, so in Rn, uh, and then chooses a point also in Rn, simply means the continuity of that mapping. If you were in the more general revelation mechanism, you would have to talk about topology and preferences and so forth, but that's not going to be important. Okay, so, well, okay, so these are things that we know. Now, notice that if I'm just asking for efficiency and incentive compatibility, and also perhaps continuity, that's not a very difficult job to get, and that's not even something for which you need a one-dimensional context. 
In fact, there is a ve very general thing which I tend to call a, a folk theorem or a folk proposition because the proof is really easy, that if you take a, a fixed priority rule, the, the, the thing that some people call, in a way that I hate, the terminology that I hate of serial dictator, but I prefer to call it a fixed priority rule, uh, but it's the same idea, namely, uh, you know, we have a very strict ordering of our agents and we know that agent one is going to be the one for which, at first, all the efforts of the, of the mechanism uh, will be uh, applied. So therefore, uh, uh, we do the best first for agent one and we give to agent one her peak, which is always feasible because, uh, because of my general picture. So conditional on giving this, uh, her peak to agent one, then agent two, uh, we give her or him his best feasible allocation in the slice of the set Z, capital Z that remains, and so on. So doing that, uh, you will, it will always be efficient and strongly group strategy proof. It will even be continuity uh, if the set Z is convex. So it, it's really, it works fine. So therefore the bite uh, of my result is the fact that we can also have fairness. Of course it's the same as in gibbard satterthwaite right? In gibbard satterthwaite if we want efficiency and incentive compatibility, it's simple, it's the dictator. What's difficult is to add any, any form of uh, fairness. So what are the fairness axioms? And here uh, we have um, a sort of a choice, we have a sort of a portfolio of axioms, uh, which are like what? So the first one is the standard so-called horizontal equity type condition, which is that uh, you want to treat agents equally if the problem initially has them equal. So notice that on the set capital Z, I'm not making any systematic symmetry assumption at this stage in the general form. So I have to talk about permutation sigma of the agents which leave the set Z invariant. And there may be some, there may be some subset of permutation leaving the leaving Z invariant. If that's the case, then it must be that my mechanism respect this symmetry. So that the two people, I mean, well, I mean, you, you see what I mean. Huh? You, if it's, uh, it's not necessarily even a, a symmetry which is uh, um, permuting two agents, it could be more general than that. But okay, so I want to respect any symmetry which is already present in the set of feasible allocations. Similarly, I can def then define NV freeness by saying that if the particular permutation of I and J leaves the set invariant, then I and J should not mutually envy each other. I mean, there should be no envy between I and J. And finally, a different kind of uh, fairness condition, which is more inspired by bargaining sort of context. I may have in mind a certain benchmark allocation, status quo, uh, whatever, and I may want to guarantee that everybody is at least, uh, at least as well off as at this initial benchmark allocation. And that would that certainly make sense in, in quite a few of the, of the examples. Okay. And then I will call an allocation omega symmetric, the allocation itself a feasible profile, if it respects all the symmetry of, of the set Z. And then the theorem is that if Z is closed and convex, and if you pick any symmetric allocation omega, then you can construct at least one mechanism which is going to be peak only and have all the properties that I mentioned. Okay? So everything is, can be met. And moreover, and, and that's going to be the second part of the result, um, most of the time it's going to be more than one, but not always. Okay? So in a, just to give you the, the punchline, I mean, uh, the only case in which it's no, going to be one, I mean, at least that, that I know so far, will be a generalization of the non-disposable division model where in, we have such result, but otherwise uh, it's not something where you can expect uniqueness at all, at all. And again, I repeat the convexity here, if I have time, I'll show you the picture. Convexity is sufficient, but not necessary. It's, uh, okay, the proof is constructive and fairly simple because it's, uh, again, in the similar to the uniform rationing rule, it's, it's an egalitarian idea following the, this old concept that we know well, the leximin ordering and this, this uh, 
uh, this uh, ordering which was proposed as a sort of alternative to the utilitarian ordering in, in uh, post-Rawlsian social choice, uh, we could say. So we basically, we start from the benchmark allocation and we equalize benefits. What do I mean by that? I mean, at the, at the benchmark allocation, I get a certain allocation omega i and I have my peak pi, which is somewhere else. So my benefit, I will simply measure it uh, as this distance. I mean, it's perfectly arbitrary. I mean, I, I could have different scales for different agents, but since I want symmetry, so I, I measure the benefit from, uh, for agent i as how far he is from the omega i in the direction of his peak. And those are the quantity that I equalize as much as possible with feasibility. That's all. It's simple as that. And I notice here that, you know, in fact, this, the usage of leximine ordering in the, to, to get some nice incentive compatibility properties has received some recent attention, but we don't have time to go into literature reviews. Um, okay, so this is the redefinition of the leximine uh, ordering, which I think in this audience most of us know very well. It's the, uh, you apply the lexicographic ordering to the reordered set of, uh, uh, allocations. So it's complete symmetric. It is discontinuous. However, its maximum over a convex compact set is unique. And that's where it's actually possible to deal with it because it is, in fact, even though it's discontinuous, it has some. Uh, so here, my definition here makes sense. So here, notice the definition A interval B is really the rectangle in, I mean, Rn. So AB is the rectangle from A to B. Uh, where the, the coordinates are the, mi the minimum and maximum on each coordinate. And this is the absolute value, this is the notation for absolute value in each coordinate. So f omega of p, p is the set of reported peaks. That's what the ideal that they want, and x is what they get. So x is going to be a feasible allocation in the set from omega to p, so it's important that for each person I go from omega i toward his or her peak, of course, because that's, I want to go away, uh, to improve upon omega. And in that set, I want that the, the vector of absolute benefit, xi minus omega i for each coordinate, is leximine maximal uh, for all alternative ways. Okay? Right? So I'm equalizing the benefits as much as possible following the leximine. Whatever omega I take, symmetric or not, this rule will always be efficient, have the guaranteed of omega, will have the continuity, which is the hardest to prove, and the, the strong incentive compatibility property. And if on top of this I take omega symmetric, then it's an easy matter to check that it has the symmetry and, and no envy. Again, of course, because the leximine ordering itself is symmetric. Okay. So, thanks. Applying the theorem, and that's where, in some sense, the, the result uh, was fun because I, I sort of, uh, it, it unified the result with, uh, of Eve and, and uh, those earlier results on, on voting, but it also showed some nice structure when we want to at least restrict attention to the case where the set Z is symmetric in all permutation. Uh, of course, the Immediately when you do social choice uh, mechanism design, uh, you always have a sort of reflex to look for the most symmetric situation because this is where, if you find a good mechanism, it's going to have the most potential application, the, it's going to be the most compelling. So let's think about the case where my closed convex set Z is actually symmetric in all coordinates. Well, there are, there are only three types of fully symmetric uh, con closed convex set in Rn. If you think of their affine span, span the affine span span of such a set can only be of three types. Either the affine span is span is the diagonal, in which case z itself is contained in the diagonal and we have a voting problem. Or the affine span is orthogonal to the diagonal, which means that the sum of the xi in all of z is constant. So you are, a, you are in a generalized division problem. You are actually dividing uh, a fixed quantity, or it's a full dimension, okay? Those are the only three cases. You cannot have something uh, in between because of the symmetry. 
Uh, so these two are the sort of known context where here the voting context there is absolutely nothing new because we, we know uh, everything that's going on. Here we're going to generalize a bit uh, Eve's result uh, and here it goes to a, a new class of, of problems. So for voting we know about the class of generalized median uh, voting rules and what happens is my, my rule f omega, the one which has this benchmark omega in mind, is the, the classic uh, most conservative voting rule where omega is going to be enforced unless everybody agrees that we should go to the right of omega or everybody agrees we should go to the left of omega. And if, we, if everybody agrees we should go to the right of omega, then the rule will select the one which is closest to omega. So it's really the, the, you know, the super conservative where it's so hard to push away from the status quo. So of course it's one of the rules among a, a family which is uh, of dimension at least n minus one. So it's just one, one rule. Now, non-disposable division problem. That's where the thing is interesting because, okay, so the general form is we are dividing sigma xi is constant and then there are additional constraints which are arbitrary except that they are symmetric and convex, okay? So in the case of Eve, it would be uh, the simplex, but it could be something more general. So then omega is the, uh, if, the, the good thing is since, since the span, the set Z is contained in a simple hyperplane, there is only a single allocation which is symmetric, which is the equal split, right? By symmetry, you, you have no choice. So there is only a single rule f omega in that context. And uh, it's the equal split allocation. And of course, the, the rule we find, because we already know that the uniform rational rule is canonical, is again the uniform rational rule. However, we have a kind of a new interpretation, nothing very deep, but the, the traditional way we interpret the rationing rule is equalizing share among efficient allocation. We have the efficiency constraints that, you know, the one-sidedness condition that if there is excess demand, everybody should get below or vice versa. And given that constraints, we equalize share and we get a Lorentz dominant allocation, etc. Now, here you do something else, which doesn't look exactly the same at first, but in fact turns out to be the same, that we equalize benefit from the guaranteed equal split. So we start from one end each and we say, ah, okay, we're going to count a benefit for you up or down, depending on whether your peak is above or below, and we're going to leximine on that. So, okay, it's just an alternative interpretation. Now, bipartite rationing is a more complicated model. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, here, again, there is a canonical egalitarian feasible allocation, but the, uh, but the rule that uh, we discussed with uh, Boshe and Ilkilik, which is another uh, rule with uh, all of these strong properties, is actually different from f omega. So already there you have multiplicity. Uh, well, balancing equal and uh, demand and supply, it's, it's, similar, it's similar things. I just want to mention quickly this proposition. This is a generalization of the result Sprumont and Ching, Sprumont improved by Ching 1994, that the uniform rationing rule is the only rule that is efficient, strategy proof, and has equal treatment of equals. Right? So efficient strategy proof and symmetry is enough to characterize the uniform rationing rule. Can we get something similar when we have a more general rationing rule which could include constraints such as, you know, in the simplex, or oh, I want to uh, maxi uh, minimize, put a lower bound on the joint uh, shares of two agents. I mean, all kinds of constraints you can, you can invent. You can, but you need, uh, at least for the proof I was able to pull, uh, more, more axioms, more, more assumptions. It's going to be, the rule is going to be characterized by efficiency, symmetry, continuity, and strong group strategy proofness. And I was not able to tell if strategy proofness alone would be enough. Okay? Uh, so, okay, so it is, it is a bit of a weaker result, but uh, it's very similar. It's Your C is not necessarily a symmetric. It is, it is. Symmetric, symmetric. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Okay. So, um, okay, so you see, for instance, you have you had additional constraints there. So, it's possible, again, it's possible that the theorem would hold with strategy proofness. The difficulty is that 
in this kind of context, if you add, you see, you divide 100 shares, but in addition, you have that no two agent can own more than two thirds of the shares, let's say. So it's a simple subset of the simplex. There, efficient allocations are not always one-sided. And that's where you cannot reproduce the standard argument. And that's where, uh, okay, so that's a technical thing which makes, uh, makes it that the theorem in that sense uh, uh, needs more uh, assumption. Okay, full dimensional. So there, uh, a, lot of, a lot of possibility. I want to conclude with uh, two minutes, I have, a, yeah. With one example, so this is gonna be a location example with positive externality, namely, you know, the, my agents are choosing in the set Z, oh, the Z has become an X uh, here, uh, just to make sure we are awake. And um, so that's the, that's the ellipse, right? And what happens? What happens really here is that you have four, four rationing models. Remember that, okay, an agent one, he chooses uh, a P1 in Z1, which is this interval. Agent two chooses one in Z2, this interval. And if they happen to choose some point at the interior of Z, then of course that's what you should choose because it's the only efficient point. What's important is what happens when the P is not. So here, what you have is the following situation. I mean, go, you, take, you take the extreme corner over here and you look at its image. And, and then you show that uh, with the properties uh, of the mechanism, all of this rectangle is sent to this image. So this is the equivalent in the uniform rationing rule of saying everybody wants more than one over n, therefore they each get one over n. And then when, one, when it's not the case that everybody wants uh, more in this direction than D, then you, you give maximum to one agent and you push in this direction. So, so you have this sort of pattern and here, down there, it's very small, but it's the same thing. I mean, there is the capital C point goes to the small C and then here it goes horizontally and vertically. So for those of you who know a bit that uh, literature, this is essentially what the uniform rationing rule does in the case of excess, uh, excess demand. And, and this gives you a sense of the, of the general figure, but the general figure can be more complicated. And finally, this is an example to say that, look, I do exactly the same figure as before, but my set Z, instead of being a convex potato, becomes this sort of non-convex thing, but still nicely shaped, and I can do exactly the same thing. So I still have a mechanism with all the good properties, even though the set, feasible set is non-convex. So, but then of course I have example where the set is non-convex and you cannot do anything. So, all right, so right now, uh, this is, uh, you know, the conclusion is that we, we have an embarrassment of riches. I mean, uh, when the model involves a set of full dimension, uh, as well as in many cases, probably where it involves uh, uh, a division, but with non-symmetric uh, non constraints, then the, f the set of uh, good rules is enormous. And I have some examples that I'm starting to ex explain a bit in the paper where you see that uh, you really have, uh, there is a lot of work to be done, I think, to go to small, uh, small nice families of rules in, in specific models. All right, thank you. So uh, trees are not there, trees. Uh, no, they yeah, well, I thought you know, I thought about that. Well, uh, yes, the, the, the reason is because as you describe your rule, it seems that it would nicely work as well, right? Along a tree with single peak preferences, like Gabriel did, and so on. Yeah, but to, but in the set Z, it would have to be that the ZI is a tree. The the projection, the set Z of feasible allocation would give for each agent a position in his own tree. So you would have to think of a model in which uh, Z is a profile of each one in his own tree, which is fine for, I mean, for the voting model, it's fine because it's the same for everybody and, and we know that things work. But to get a good example of that, uh, more generally, is a bit tough. But I agree, I agree that it should... So well, it, my, my question was one, whether it was in and if not, since these trees are not one-dimensional, but 
but the somewhat piecewise, yeah, yeah, one-dimensional, yeah, yeah. whether there is an extension in that direction. Because also, you know, with, with, the, with the work with Matt and I did on, on, on exchange economies, in, in the two by two case, it's, it's a completely similar thing, but then it, it blows up, but it doesn't blow up to anything, to things that look very much like trees and strange objects, yes. umbrellas yes. and things like yes. that, which are more linear. So this linearity yes. can be... No, no, but, but again, I have, no, no, I, no I agree, I agree. It's, it's just that I, I hesitated to, you know, the idea that you will have a model where Z um, is, a, is a Cartesian product of, of trees, to get a good example is tough to start. But, and, uh, and I suspect that if you, yeah, if you put out the same Leximin thing, I mean, uh, you probably can do it. I mean, I didn't do it. I, I'm just, I have the gut feeling that it would work. But my, uh, my first uh, sort of answer is, let's find a good example of that before we do it, right? In a sense, uh, because uh, it's not so obvious to find good examples of that. Yes, uh, you need to. So if the, if the set Z is not uh, convex, but that the Leximin still has a, a unique solution? It may have several. Yes, but if it happens to have a unique solution, it, does the mechanism then have all the nice properties? Because you mentioned that, you know, you mentioned I that for, I think for some probably convex, for some convex, non-convex sets, it, it doesn't work. Is it because the, the program doesn't have a unique maximizer or? It's not because of that. I can, sh I can show you later. It's possible that that would be a condition. And the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, what, what does it mean on the set Z to say that on every rectangle omega P intersected with that then there is a unique leximin? I mean, uh, geometrically, it's, it's not obvious what this uh, condition means. But uh, yes, yes, yes. There is probably some underlying more general geometric condition which would allow to do that, yes. I, I've thought about it, it's not so, so obvious, but perhaps. <coughs> well, thank you.